As promised, here's an example where we're doing every possible transformation to a sign graph in this case. So my directions are to include at least one full period and label the five important points. Just want to, again, familiarize you with those directions. And then I'm also asking you to give me some information about this function and its graph. So I want you to state, whoops, the amplitude, the period, phase shift, and vertical shift. We talked about those in the last video. Okay. And notice I specified for the two shifts, I want the amounts and the direction. Then I'm also asking for the domain and the range. Now, we didn't talk about those in the last video, but the domain for any transformation of sine or cosine is going to be all real numbers because sine and cosine are defined everywhere. And the range is just going to be the interval along the y-axis between the low point and the high point. So once I've got the graph, I'll be able to figure that out fairly nicely. Okay. Now, I could answer these questions first because I know how to get these things from the equation. I'm going to go ahead and draw the graph first, and then when I'm answering these questions, I can just sort of be double checking that my graph reflects what I'm saying. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is get this input into factored form. So this is 2 sine of, I'm going to factor out that negative 2 pi. So then that's times the quantity x. Since I'm factoring out a negative, this switches to a negative, and I'm essentially dividing this by 2 pi. So I'm going to be left with 1 half. And I can double check. If I distribute negative 2 pi times negative 1 half, that will give me back my plus pi. And then don't forget that plus 1. Okay. Now, when I'm multiplying by a negative number, I want to deal with that up front before I start graphing. So this was sine. Sine is an odd function. Opposite input gives me the opposite output. So I can bump that negative sign to the outside and say this is negative 2 sine of positive 2 pi times x minus a half plus 1. Fabulous. Okay. So now I know that everything in here, that's my input, that's going to affect my graph horizontally. The things that I'm doing after I evaluate sine, so multiplying by negative 2 and adding 1, that's going to affect the graph vertically. And I've learned how to deal with all the vertical and the horizontal transformations. So let's do the vertical first. It doesn't really matter. But with the vertical, I know that I just need to keep track of the high, middle, and low values. So before any transformations, the high is 1, the middle is 0, and the low is negative 1. And I do like to do my vertical transformations one at a time, but I'm not going to do the whole graph. I'm just going to keep track of these values. So I've got a vertical axis with high, middle, and low marked off. Let's see. Vertical transformations respect order of operations. So I'm going to do the multiplication first and then the adding 1. So if I multiply by negative 2, that's going to change things to 1 times negative 2 becomes negative 2. 0 stays at 0. Negative 1 times negative 2 becomes 2. Do be careful. 2 is above negative 2. Okay. But because I multiplied by a negative, I know that we've done a flip. And I want to write that down. Okay. So with the normal graph for a sign, I would start at the middle value and go up. When I flipped it, that means I'm going to start at the middle but I'm going to go down so, so that I don't forget. I indicate that visually and I write it down. Whatever trick is going to work for you so that you don't forget that. Then we're going to add 1. And so let's see, 2 is going to bump up to 3, 0 is going to bump up to 1, negative 2 is going to bump up to negative 1, but we're still starting in the middle and going down. So this flip applies. So we've done the flip here, we've done just the flip here, we've done the flip and the vertical shift. Okay, so the y values that I'm going to care about are 3, 1, and negative 1. Fabulous! And I know my pattern is the pattern for a flipped sine graph. Let's deal with the x values. So I know that sine does its thing once as the input varies from 0 to 2 pi. My input now is 2 pi times x minus a half. I'm going to solve for x to get a new starting and ending point for the period that I'm going to graph. 
So we'll divide through by 2 pi. So 0 less than or equal to x minus a half less than or equal to 1. Add the 1 half. So 1 half less than or equal to x less than or equal to 1 would have been 2 halves plus 1 half is 3 halves. Okay, so the graph that we draw is going to start at an x value of 1 half and end at an x value of 3 halves. All right, so the new period, that's going to be the original period 2 pi divided by the absolute value of whatever I was multiplying by. So that's going to be 1. And I can do a quick check. That does equal 3 halves minus 1 half. So that is the distance between my new starting and my new ending point. Okay. So if that's the period, the increment is a quarter of that. So the increment is 1 over 4. So that means the x values that I care about, I'm going to start at 1 half, and I'm going to clear some space. I only really need this. These are the y values I'm going to care about. Okay, so the x values that I'm going to care about plotting, we're going to start at 1 half. Now I'm just going to make a note below it that that's 2 fourths, because that's the increment. So I'm going to add 1 fourth to each thing. So 2 fourths plus 1 fourth would be 3 fourths, plus a fourth would be 4 fourths, but that'll reduce to 1, plus a fourth would be 5 fourths, plus a fourth would be 6 fourths, and that one will reduce to 3 halves. So these are the x values that I'm going to want to plot. Okay, so let's do it. I'm going to just keep that over here, and I'm going to just recopy this vertical axis where I've got my 3, 1, and negative 1 and the information that we're starting in the middle and going down. That way I can clear some space on this very small whiteboard. Oh, I missed the big boards in the classroom. Okay, all right. So, let's see. The y values that I will mark off are negative one, one, and three. I like to, although it's not absolutely necessary, just draw in dotted lines at those heights. That helps me to make sure that I'm plotting my points accurately. Okay, now I know I'm starting at one half, but because my increment is one fourth, I'm going to let the tick marks on the x-axis correspond to a fourth. So my starting point of one half was two fourths, so that'll be two tick marks over. So that's one half. Okay. And then we're at 3 fourths, and then 1, and then 5 fourths, and then 3 halves. So those are my important x values. Now, we're starting in the middle and going down. So at the first x value at 1 half, we're at a middle value of 1. The next important x value, we're at a low point, so that's going to be at negative 1. The next important x value was 1. We're back to a middle value of 1. Next important x value was 5 fourths. It's a little hard to see. We're up at a high value of 3. And then the next important x value was 3 halves, and we're back at 0. So I can connect those dots, making sure I have arrows to indicate what's going on. Now, I could just have an arrow here to indicate that this continues, but if I want to, this was my increment. So I can actually see I'm going to be up at 1 here and back down at 0 here. So I can actually graph my exact y-intercept if I wanted to. Not absolutely necessary, but make sure that if you do cross the y-axis when you're graphing things, you're crossing at approximately the right place. In this case, it should be exactly the right place because that's two increments away from our starting point. We were also asked some questions about this function and its graph. I almost forgot to answer them, but let's do that now. So the amplitude, now I can get that from the formula 
or from the graph, I'm just going to use both to confirm that I've done things right. The amplitude should be the absolute value. I'm going to just work with this last version because that's the one I worked with. It's the absolute value of the number that I'm multiplying the trig function by. And that would be 2. And if I look at the graph, that is the vertical distance between my middle value and my high value. That's the distance between 1 and 3. Excellent. Now the period we had calculated, we said that that was 1. That was, remember, the original period of 2 pi, let's write this out, divided by the absolute value of what I'm multiplying x by. That's just 2 pi over 2 pi, which is 1. Okay. All right. Now, the phase shift. Because I put this in factored form, I can see that from this form directly. The phase shift, we went 1 half. And since we were subtracting that, it was 1 half to the right. Now, if I take a look, yep, that was our starting point at 1 half. Instead of starting at an x value of 0, we started at an x value of 1 half. The vertical shift, that's accomplished by this number that I'm adding after I evaluate the sign. Since that's positive, we moved things in the positive direction, so it was up 1. Okay. Now, it's a little harder to tell if you look at the whole graph. The important thing is to look at what's the middle value, because the middle value before we shifted anything was at 0. So the, if the middle value is 1, we have moved it up 1. The high value is 2 more than the original high value, but that's because we also stretched things. So if you're looking for the vertical shift from the graph, you want to take a look at where did the middle value get moved to, because the middle value is the only one that isn't affected by the stretching or shrinking. Okay, I mentioned that the domain for any trig function was going to be all real numbers, or equivalently, of course, in interval notation, that's negative infinity to infinity. The range is just going to be the interval between the low value and the high value. So that's going to be from negative 1 to 3. Okay. Now, do be careful. Make sure that you include those. So these are brackets. Um, and make sure that you go from the low value to the high value.